this episode is just about ready to go to YouTube, but I thought I'd pop this little bit in before to explain and to answer some questions I've had, okay? Now, basically, the questions were, what are the circumstances that brought me to Lucaran and how did I end up living on a boat for free? Okay, so, fair question. Apologize for not making that clear before. So the big picture is this. While I was, while I was down in Columbia, enjoying Palomino and going to the beach every day, I had to be thinking about, well, what's next, right? And for me, I thought, well, I could go get a beach rental someplace and just be a bum on a beach. But I got thinking about crewing on a boat. You may or may not know that crewing opportunities do exist. They exist for all of us. And you can check some of these links. I used findacrew.net. There's another group called Crew Finder, and there's a couple of others, which I'll post here on the video. But uh, there are opportunities for people, even with zero experience, to join a crew of a boat. It might be perfect for people who can't afford their own boat or can only crew for a few weeks and they, you know, they before they jump in and buy a boat. I came to Loop Run because there was a boat there looking for a crew to help get the boat out, out to the next destination. And that's why I came. <coughs> However, shortly after arriving, it was pretty obvious that there was some personality conflict and there was a conflict between me and a cat which I don't think could have been overcome. So I made the decision to move on to make it easier on everybody. And I was gonna just leave the Dominican Republic or go to some beach condo somewhere and just chill out, learn to kite surf, whatever. And that's when <clears throat> some of the other folks in the marina gave me this opportunity to live on a boat. Turns out that there had been a boat for which the owner had had a life event. That's all I'm gonna say. None of us need to know the circumstances. The bottom line was that the, the owner of the boat was no longer able to live on the boat and the new owner, because of the COVID and other personal circumstances, was not able to be here either. So the boat was just lying here idle, floating in the water. And if you're familiar with machinery of any kind, sort, it's uh, not good. It's not good for a house, it's not good for a car, it's not good for a boat to just sit there in the weather and having nobody looking after it. So that's really it. I, I was asked to stay aboard the boat for free and look after the boat. Um, I don't know if there's more that we need to explain. It, and that's not for any of us to know. Let's uh, respect people's privacy and move on. So. Today's episode is dinghies, all about dinghies. There'll be some opinions here. Some people may disagree. That's okay. Everybody's entitled to an opinion, even if it's wrong. <laughs> Mine may be wrong, but I've got, I, over the last few weeks, <clears throat> I made some pretty good opinions about dinghies. So enjoy. Thank you for watching. Well, in general, a dinghy is just a small boat, any small boat. But for our purposes, we're looking at the first definition there. It's a, it's a small boat that's a tender to our bigger sailboat. And that's what we're here to talk about. Why? Why are you doing it? But what I've learned in the last three weeks is that a lot of people spend a lot of time on the dinghy. And if you're going to be in a mooring field like this or at an anchorage, that dinghy is pretty damned important. So you think you're back at some house and out in your driveway there's a Honda Civic or a, a big truck, whatever. You've got a vehicle that'll get you around. You need to go to the market, you jump in your car or truck and you go. And the same is true here, but you don't use cars and trucks, we use a dinghy. So if you're a live aboard or even just here for a few weeks like I am, you're living on a boat, you've got to have a dinghy that is absolutely reliable that you can start and stop when you need it. You preferably don't have to pump up every damn day like I do you know and if you needed to you can row it so we're gonna explore dinghies today and I'll show you lots of different types of dinghies that are out there and at the end I will give you my formal opinion on dinghies that's what's in store for you today so thank you for joining me 
It's another beautiful day here in the Dominican Republic and the topic is dinghies. Let's go. Now, dinghies come in all shapes and sizes. You got the hard dinghies, like the, one, the second one here, because it has a, a spot for a mast, it's got a spot for a centerboard. It's reasonably small, reasonably wide, probably rows really easily because it has a long runner down the center of the keel, and it can take an outboard. Same is true of the other two guys, you know, but you don't want a dinghy this big. That's too big to be a dinghy on your sailboat. Most people have inflatables. That's a rigid bottom inflatable. That's the same as what I have in Scotland. Another rigid bottom inflatable, but his fuel tank is up. This is a different type of dinghy. This reminds me of the Portland Pudgies. Whoa! Oh, <laughs> I know, I don't want to go swimming today. <laughs> Tomorrow, if it's not raining, I'll go out and there's a boat that has one hanging on the divert. A smaller, squatter little boat. <clears throat> you know, probably good for two people. Here's a non-rigid bottom dinghy. It's got like a, a flexible bladder underneath the floor, so it's not rigid bottom. And the owner of this says the boat does not plane well. This one probably rows the best, probably sails the best, but it's probably also the most tippy, which is why the owner put a bunch of rocks in the bottom, bottom of it. Okay, here's another hard bottom uh, dinghy, made it with a, a fiberglass bottom. Okay, so I'm in uh, one of the restaurants here in uh, Cabarete. So, so what are the attributes of a perfect dinghy? I would say first, it's got to be durable. It's got to be able to take light impacts. It's got to crash into dinghy docks sometimes. It's got to get bumped by other dinghies. It's got to rub up against dinghy dock. Um, and it's got to be able to handle the sun, prolonged exposure to the sun, and it's got to handle the sea. Frankly, you might need to beat into a 25 knot wind against three foot seas, you know, to get back out to your boat someday or to get ashore. So the dinghy has to be able to handle that. The dinghy has to be rowable. Certainly something I learned in uh, Luperon because I had a dinghy with a suspect engine and at some points I had a dinghy with no engine. And I had two oars and you have to be able to row. And the uh, and that's all I'm going to say about that at the moment. So the dinghy has to be able to row. It has to be able to be rowed. There ought to be some sort of, there ought to be some sort of longitudinal uh, stringers or some sort of keel that'll prevent the dinghy from just spinning like a frisbee in the water. Because it's very difficult to row some dinghies. So any dinghy of mine in a perfect world would be able to be rowed like a proper rowboat. The dinghy should be able to be sailed, in my opinion. This is opinion only, right? The dinghy should be able to be sailed. The dinghy needs to be a viable lifeboat. <laughs> Suppose you have to ditch and you don't have a life raft. What are you going to do? You're going to make for the dinghy. If you jump in an inflatable with a fuel supply that can take you 10 miles, you're done, okay? You can't get yourself out of safety. So in concert with being a lifeboat, it's got to be borderline unsinkable. It's got to be able to hold all your ditch bag of gear, uh, all your safety equipment, your sun protection, your weather protection, you know, and it's got to, um, I, in my opinion, be, be saleable. It's got to have a mast and a sail, and the dinghy needs to be lightweight enough while empty to be managed by one old guy like me. If a dinghy is so heavy that it weighs 125 pounds, that's very difficult for one human being to just manhandle around your deck. So a lightweight dinghy is always better than a heavy dinghy, as far as handling it. The heavy dinghy might keep the seas better. So there you go. You know, you can't have it all. The dinghy needs to be stowable. A lot of sailboats have davits, but a lot of sailboats do not have davits. Yeah. If you don't have davits, what are you going to do when it's time to get out to sea and where are you going to put your dinghy? Generally, most cruisers take the dinghy and they upturn it upside down and mount it and store it up on the main deck above the coach room. So the dinghy's got to be stowable when you get to sea. We got to talk about payload. So a dinghy. The 
thingy needs to have payload sufficient to take at least two adults, so maybe children, and usually they're coming back with groceries or maybe bottles of water. You don't know, maybe three or four jerry cans full of diesel. That stuff's so heavy. So diesel is about uh, a little, around eight pounds per get pounds per gallon. That's, a, that's an estimate. You know, water is about 8.6 pounds a gallon. That's heavy when you add it up. So your, di your dinghy has to have the payload capacity to be able to load two people or the rest of the crew and your cargo into the, into the dinghy and keep it safe while you're getting out to your boat. The cargo's got to stay dry. And the one thing I really, really learned at Blooper Run is that the engine has got to be rock solid reliable. And these are the attributes of the perfect dinghy. But what kind of gear goes with a dinghy? On a dinghy, typically you'll see some people will keep at least one oar. I keep both oars on board. The little milk jug top there, that's what you use to bail the water out. Some people keep an air pump in the dinghy. The gray thing is a pump to remove water from the dinghy. The black thing next to it is the air pump for pumping up the dinghy. The red thing is a fuel tank. Okay, there's a squeeze bulb for pump priming it with fuel. And that's kind of the equipment you have on board. I keep a milk, milk crate for just miscellaneous stuff if I'm carrying things to help keep it dry. And the only things not mentioned so far were the locks. You do have to find a way to lock your equipment or those outboard engines will be stolen. So we've talked about dinghy types, we've talked about dinghy equipment, and um, this is a government dock in Dubron. It's very instructive when you look at a dinghy dock to see all the different types of small vessels that you can use as a tender or as a dinghy to get to the shore. Some people go with kayaks. They're fast, they're easy to row, but everything gets wet. Okay, so there's a downside. A lot of people have inflatables. And again, all these boats have pros and cons. There's no one perfect answer for, for everybody. Well, let's start with kayaks. Whether it's inflatable or a hard poly ca kayak, they're very inexpensive. You can get the hard poly kayaks for almost for free, you know, if they're in a used condition. Kayaks, as I said before, they row very easily. The only downside to a kayak really is that they can't carry a lot of cargo and whatever goes in a kayak is liable to get wet. But still, many, many cruisers use them for recreation purposes. And next up is the inflatables. You know, these things are ubiquitous. They're everywhere. Almost everybody uses them. And the reason they use them is because they're a great utility dinghy. The big downsides are that they don't row worth a damn and that they get the leaks. On the plus side, they're stable, they're reasonably tough in other ways. They plane well, they motor well, they do, and they carry, have a very good payload. And next up are the hard shell boats. They can be wood, they can be fiberglass, they can be wood covered by fiberglass, or they can be metal, usually aluminum. And I would say that if it's solid fiberglass or aluminum, those boats will last forever. They are as good today as they were more 30 years ago if you can find a used one. And if you can find a used one, that means you can get them very, very inexpensively. Most of these boats are also designed to be good to row and good for sailing. So they make an excellent choice to be a dinghy. And there's two non-standard options I do want to mention. The first one is a port boat This is essentially a plastic folding boat. It has these rubber hinges, the black things there, that are flexible and are leak-tight. The boat can fold up and be the size of a surfboard. Once they're assembled, they are, have a very good payload. They're very stable, and they can take a big outboard as well. I'm including the Portland Pudgy here. 
This is essentially a hard shell boat, but it's not fiberglass. It's made out of polyethylene, just like the sit-on-top kayaks. It's a great little boat. They're made to row, they're made to sail. It even has a built-in wheel at the bottom to help you drag it around. And like the Porta boat, the Portland Pudgy can be fitted with a number of attachments and accessories. Namely, it can be a life raft. It has a canopy that you can buy. It can be fitted with a sail. You can put outboards on them. Same with the Porta boat. The Porta boat can be fitted with a sail attachment as well. For both of them together, I would say the same disadvantage is that they're quite expensive. By the time you buy the sailing kit or the life raft kit, you're well upwards of $5,000 if you buy this new. So, what am I going to do for a dinghy on Skipjack? Well, the bottom line is I'm going to stick with what I have. Um, because I do own a 3 meter rigid hull inflatable boat with a fiberglass bottom. And it does have a leak. On the port side, I know we have a leak. So I'm going to get a patch kit and we're going to fix a leak, of course. And to keep this boat is really an economic decision because I don't want to drop three or four thousand dollars on a brand new boat. Not if I have a perfectly serviceable boat right now. Oh, there we go. Well, there's your leak. Shit, and it appears it's leaked before because I'm looking at a patch. The round thing is a patch. So I've got to figure out. I guess we'll rip that patch off and try to make a new one. Shit. <laughs> I say shit because I think the likelihood of success with these inflatables of getting a patch that holds is just not too good. I thought that this would be the leak. This is a fill valve. And so you all know that my boat is up in Scotland at the moment and one great thing about the UK is that they love their dinghies. Pretty easy for me to find used hard shell dinghies. So I'm gonna keep my eye out for an old fiberglass or an old aluminum um, hard shell boat you know a little sailing dinghy that's about three three and a half meters no more and if i can find one of those i will go ahead and swap out my inflatable for a hard shell dinghy suggestions lots of guys have probably been down this road before just a little spot right at the seam of course so looking at this leak tells me what's the best type of dinghy to have you know a hard shell dinghy is the best this gentleman made his own dinghy. He's a metal worker, and he welded himself up an aluminum slash aluminum dinghy, complete with a mast and sails, and you'll notice he uses a sculling oar as a backup means of steering. Really, that's a great little dinghy. So, I do appreciate everybody watching the video, and I hope you'll watch the next one. So, look forward to your comments. Take care, everyone.